Welcome, welcome to episode three of the Theater Cues podcast, just in time for Thanksgiving. In just a few minutes, I'll be chatting with another amazing guest. But in the meantime, I think we should start things off with a theater fun fact. You're probably like, good lord, you've already told us so many theater fun facts. And yeah, I have, but it's fun for me and there's just so many good ones out there. Anyway, here's your fun fact. So, I was listening to the Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend podcast the other day, which, if you haven't listened to it, it's fantastic and hilarious. Anyway, Conan was talking to comedian and band leader Reggie Watts, and they were talking about the walls of a movie. Now, in case you don't know, the term the fourth wall is used to refer to the audience. Studio Binder says, quote, This term comes from the theater, where the three surrounding walls enclose the stage, while an invisible fourth wall is left out for the sake of the viewer. Conan and Reggie Watts were talking about how the film Ferris Bueller's Day Off uses the fourth wall to its advantage by breaking it. Breaking the fourth wall, as it is commonly referred, is when an actor speaks directly to the audience as if they're a character in the production. So next time a script you read says something about the fourth wall, you know what it is and how to break it. And as I always like to say, the more you know, the more you know. Sorry, Aristotle, sort of messed up your quote. Back to you, Nate. Thanks, Nate. Good stuff, huh? Well, I think it's about time that we jump into the interview today. My guest is an accomplished actor who has done her fair share of time on stage and screen and has written her book, Prudence Pickle Presents Etiquette for Professional Actors. She was in the national tour of My One and Only with 10-time Tony winner Tommy Toon, appeared on the 90s TV hit Northern Exposure multiple times, and has been in many, many theater shows, including Hello, Dolly, To Kill a Mockingbird, and my personal favorite, The Music Man. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the fabulous Peggy O'Connell. Hi, Peggy. It's good to see you. Hi. Good to see you too, Nate. It's been a while. It has. It's been too long, and I think of you a lot. You were great to work with. It's yeah, really you too. Fun time. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, I was just thinking about the Music Man the other day. It's been like five years. Really? Yeah. Yeah, you something were, like that. You were what? About ten. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were tremendous. You're a wonderful actor. I hope you keep it up. Thank you. Um, all right. So first off, um, just introduce yourself and like, what are your greatest hits as far as the uh, theater and film world go? And how did you get your career started? Okay. Um, greatest hits. Um, well, let's see. Um, I was on Broadway um, and then we went on the road right away in a, a wonderful Gershwin musical with Tommy Toon and Sandy Duncan and Charles Honey Coles and Tiger Haynes called My One and Only. And I played Tommy Toon's comedic sidekick. And um, we we went everywhere in the United States about, we were three months in LA, three months in San Francisco. And we went to Japan too. And oh, wow. all over, it was really fun. You know, New York's finest tap dancers in that show. and. And it and great actors and Donny Amendola was in it. And that was a thrill. And what's another great hit? Um, well, I played Annie Oakley in Annie Get Your Gun four times in my career, and I won an award from the critics in uh, the Twin Cities, uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis, um, for playing Annie Oakley. And I I did it for ten months. Almost killed me. And <laughs> and I worked. Uh, two of the times that I played the role, I worked with a sharpshooter, and and I really and then I took the gun home and I did dishes with it under my arm. I did everything, <laughs> so it was like an appendage. That was a that was a hit. And then I did um, a TV show. I had a little ongoing part um, on a TV show uh, called Northern Exposure, and I I played a weird lady named Doris. <laughs> <laughs> were both that looked like a, a furry bathroom rug from the 50s. <laughs> and then recently, last year actually, um, came out on Hulu in November, 
I don't I don't know if I told you this or not, but I was I had a really nice part with my big scene towards the end of the movie in it's a movie called Merry Kiss Cam, like Merry Christmas, and it's about those cameras they put on people during hockey. That, like sports games, yeah. yeah. And they make them kiss, you know. <laughs> and and, uh, and it was filmed in Duluth. Duluth is called Little Hollywood now because they film up there. There's great incentives and a lot of talent. And um, and they made another one this summer. And it's really a great thing for actors around here. So there was that. And um, I, uh, oh, I've, I did a lot of work at the Guthrie. And let's see, what else? Um, I think those are my biggest hits. Oh, um I did a nightclub act in New York, and I I did what um, Jerry Stiller told me to do. He said, you start out your act at um, this certain club called the Duplex in uh, the village, and then you'll get moved up to uh, the Broadway district to Don't Tell Mamas. And then maybe you can get in at the ballroom. So I made it all the way up to the ballroom, and I found that as, as fun as it was doing a one woman show i'd i much rather like working with other actors it's it's just lonely <laughs> <laughs> but i i get around i've been working steadily um i've had really good luck and um i went back to seattle and did dolly and hello dolly oh gosh that was probably that was in 2015 and that was really fun and we had a great orchestra and and anyways, I, I I managed to keep working, which I love. I and it's a lot, when you get older, you know, you have to keep your skills up. And and by the time you get old as an actor, you've got injuries. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go, to, you know, you have to go to physical therapy and that. And how did I get started? Okay, well, um, I got started. Um, I've always always wanted to be a performer. I don't remember a time when I didn't. So there was no day that I decided to do it. It was just in my being, I guess. And uh, what happened was I I was doing a, a ballet performance and my sister was really gifted and she went on to the San Francisco Ballet School and she, she was real gifted and I was a joke. And um, so I was... <laughs> I was doing a performance and my headband fell over my eyes and I could hear the audience laughing and something, something clicked with me. And so I pulled it back up and, and I went like this and it fell down again and they were going nuts. And I (laughs) I made it happen again on purpose. And I knew for once I was doing something right on stage, but I couldn't quite figure (laughs) out what it was, but I knew it had something to do with the headband. And that kind of gave me a clue, but I majored in drama at the University of Montana. I had a wonderful, oh, wonderful um, high school drama teacher named Mrs. Bronson. And I, um, I, I put her in all, any sketch that I do, I try to put her picture in. She's in my book and she wore chopsticks in her hair. And you can <laughs> see her in the, in, in the uh, first, in the foreword. She's in the first sketch with a polka dotted dress and chopsticks in her bun. And she was really smart and really kind. And she, I just thought I wouldn't, you know, I was in Montana and you think if you're living in Montana, you can never have a career as an actor <laughs> back when I was young. And she told me, she just looked at me one day very seriously and she was a real jolly woman and she got real serious and she said, Peggy, you have the ability. And I trusted her and I believed her. And my family um, was great about it. My parents were great about it. And I got a degree in drama. And I went to Seattle and started my career there. And got in uh, uh, Actors' Equity and AFTRA. It was just AFTRA then, not AFTRA SAG. And then um, I moved to... um, I moved to the Twin Cities back here, and um, my parents had moved back here, and um, I heard they were doing Annie Get Your Gun, and I 
packed up everything assuming I'd get the part and luckily I did and it's really <laughs> kind of arrogantly stupid of me but it happened to work out and uh, I was then say, it, it works so <laughs> it kind of worked well it wasn't arrogant it was more like this is a part for me that I know I'd already done it twice and I thought I can get this and mm -hmm. so I did and it was really fun. Um, it was a very taxing role, though. It took several ounces of my flesh. And, well, I was uh, going to say, you you mentioned all the work you did outside of the theater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then um, after I got in the last union, I, I moved to New York. And I had worked with um, Jerry Stiller and Jim Handy at Guthrie. And they both took me under their wing and gave me, you know, um, an introduction to their agents. And um, it was great. Um, uh, something that, that young actors or aspiring young actors should know is that veteran actors love to help young talent. That's what we like to do. And people um, really were kind to me in New York and I learned a lot. And I, then I got the Broadway show and I, I was, Working back in um, the Twin Cities, I had already moved to New York, and I came back to do Anything Goes at the mm -hmm. Guthrie. And um, I, my agent called me and said I had an audition for my one and only. And so I flew on a Monday, on a Sunday night, and auditioned on a Monday and flew back Monday night. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. Quick turnaround. And I was I was in the basement of a friend's apartment I was staying with doing my laundry. And there was a lady with the cigarette and curlers. And I came down. I had gotten the phone call that I got the job. And I said, guess what happened to me in between the washer and the dryer? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I got in a Broadway show. And she went, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how I did it. And. Um, Northern Exposure was filmed in um, Seattle. It was a great thing for a lot of great, really good actors out there. And um, so that's, those are my big hits, I guess, and um, and how I started. Um, we took that, we took ballet and I came from a family kind of like the Marx Brothers, I always say, because my mom, <laughs> <laughs> it's true, my mom could imitate anybody until the day she died she would she would imitate all the neighbors everyone coming back from communion at church and she was screamingly funny she could do anything play the violin dance sing she taught my sisters and i how to sing harmony together when i was like five. Oh and wow so that was a big influence and then my dad was a funny guy it just i had I luckily had a wonderful, have a wonderful family. And my dad, when he would laugh, his whole face would turn red and, and he'd get those creases by his eyes. <laughs> it was a contest in, in, in the, with <laughs> myself and my sisters and brother, you know, kind of, it was an unwritten contest and un, unrecognized con contest to see who could make dad laugh. Most. <laughs> That's what my family was like. So it, not surprising i'm in show business my sister's a writer molly was a dancer we lost her she's passed away and my brother jimmy um i used to be an undercover cop and oh. yeah and so we all are in dramatic <laughs> one way or another <laughs> um you you mentioned northern exposure and um I mentioned that to my parents the other day and my dad was like, oh, that was on on my TV all the time. <laughs> it was a great show. You're too young to know about it, but it was it was a great thing for character actors because they liked it was a real eccentric kind of show. Did he tell mm -hmm. you what it was about? Uh, briefly, yeah. It took place in, in Alaska and Rob Morrow and Janine Turner uh, were the stars. And John Cullum, who was um, a, a star on Broadway, was in it. And they all lived in Seattle. And um, they, you know, um, when I met him on the show, I said, I, 
I said, boy, you were in this show and that show and on the 20th century and Shenandoah. And he goes, he looked at me and he just beamed because most people just knew him from Northern Exposure. And he goes, mm -hmm. oh, other life. It, <laughs> he's from the South. And, um, and they were really, that was a really good cast. And Elaine Miles, a Native American actor who was screamingly funny, um, she lived in the Seattle area originally. And it was, it was a real eccentric kind of show. And I had a small part and I was on four times and then they canceled. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm a theater actor mostly, but I, I do like to do film. I do. It's fun. Um, and so th that sort of uh, is a good lead into this next question. Um, because you mentioned working with, uh, you know, Tommy Toon, and I know um, you've done work with some other very, very experienced actors. So how, how was it working with some of the greats and how did they help you grow as an actor? Well, just, uh, let's see. I also worked with Lucy Arnaz and Stephanie Zimblist on the road. They oh, really? San yeah, for Sandy Duncan. And um, what I learned was um, to take your work seriously, but not yourself. And, and um, they, you know, Charles Honey Coles and Tiger Haynes were um, like my uncles. <laughs> they really, <laughs> they really, you know, I, I mean, Tiger Haynes had a, a trio in Brooklyn and they, they were the first band, I think, that Barbara Streisand ever played with. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And he, and he had a hit record long before I was born and it was called Open the Door, Richard. And it's really funny. And it's kind of a novelty tune. And Tiger and, and Honey um, was um, at the Cotton Club in Harlem. And he was also at the Apollo Theater. He, he led the Boo Parade. And anywhere we went, there were all these African-American stars that would would welcome us because we were with Honey. And huh. when we, Ella Fitzgerald is a singer I've always admired I mean that her records played constantly in our living room coming I mean, up. yeah she's she's just extremely fantastic and so talented oh that that voice there's no other like it and 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 uh i had seen her live twice before that and then we went to see her with honey and she she said I, I was going to do my dance for you tonight, but Mr. Charles Honey Coles is in the audience. And she lifted <laughs> up her skirt and kind of did a little tap. And then she sang a song from our show in it. And uh, he was he was greatly admired. But I really, I really learned to have fun um, because I was always so so focused on getting enough rest and blah, 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 practicing. And I, I went too far that way. And mm -hmm. honey, honey was great fun to go to piano bars with. And, and I learned a lot from him about phrasing and, and, um, and tiger, you know, he knew that man knew how to make an entrance and, uh, and Lucy Arnaz and Stephanie Zimbos, I learned a lot from them you know, about just, just in general, um, how to be a part of the team and how to be good at your job and, you know, the singing and dancing, of course. And well, and, uh, I mean, some of those people like Lucy Arnaz, you know, they're from families and, and are people who are just very talented with like comedic timing and things like that. Oh yeah. Um, her mom came to the show five times and I got to meet her each time. Not that I'm counting, but <laughs> it was a thrill. I was gonna say any any time you get to meet Lucille Ball, I would be uh I would be counting too. It was five times. <laughs> she was lovely. And um another person that that I I got to meet, I think she, I don't know how many times was Carol Channing. And she was also lovely. And on our 
in on Tommy and Honey's 1000th performance, they actually is is she's bigger than life and always wore one solid color, red tie, <laughs> red shoes, red skirt, red sweater, and and or else green or white. She was wearing white. It's hard to miss Carol Channing in white. But they <laughs> hit her backstage, <laughs> and she came out because she had done Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend on Broadway with Honey. And so she gave came out after the show and surprised them and gave them each a diamond. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they were good. She was a good friend of both of them, both of uh, both Tommy and Honey. And I and then I learned there were there was a quartet of older gentlemen. Uh, Honey was like seventy two, and Tiger, we didn't know how old he was. He didn't have a birth certificate. So <laughs> we had a fake birthday. <laughs> celebration <laughs> for his 110th birthday <laughs> <It's like that. laughs> but um oh what was i gonna say but uh the the older gentlemen in the quartet they were all like opera singers so i learned a lot from them you know how to take care of your voice and and they were pros they were in good voice and they had to hit some notes on the ceiling every night and eight times a week and i really admired them a lot so i was just surrounded by the best people giving me tap lessons and and honey and tiger taking me out and teaching me about phrasing a jazz tune and and how to give a beat you know and it, it, to a band it, they were just amazing i was so lucky and honored to just say hello to them, you know? Yeah, that's that's it's a <laughs> fantastic crowd to work with. Oh yeah, it was great. Um, you mentioned uh, Carol Channing, um, who you met, and um, I know that just from talking to people, you know, my age, that many young actors have the dream of being praised by reviewers for their shows, um, and you have been uh, multiple times, and in one review of uh, Hello Dolly, which you did in Seattle, the reviewer compared your performance to Carol Channing. <clears throat> oh, I didn't Barbara, see that one. And, and oh, Barbara Streisand. Oh, And wow. so what? what's it like to be, I guess, Streisand-esque and to be praised like that? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, you, well, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's very flattering, you know, and I, uh, that was very kind of them to say that to, to the, you know, great singer like that and a great comedian like her. I mean, I was, I'm, I didn't see that one. I don't read them all because, you know, it, it, it gets in your head and it interferes with your performance, good or bad. So mm -hmm. this is the first I've heard of it. I did listen to some, little things that um it was pearl bailey and barbara streisand's recordings and i stole them uh she like uh, uh just the way streisand did a, a, her vocal on on hello dolly and then on um pearl bailey she added i think they call it cantos when they went well well hello she went hello hello Hello, boys. And <laughs> well, I did that in my sound um, when they did that because I thought that was brilliant. And I don't know, maybe Carol Channing did that too. But um, I, I'd like to think I was pretty funny in the part. So <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you were fantastic. I wish I could have seen it. It was fun. I had John Lowry, who a lot of kids your age know who, I mean, uh, yeah. John Patrick Lowry, a lot of kids your name, your age will know. He was my Vandegelder in Seattle. And he's on a he does the voice of games. A lot of gaming things. Oh, okay. And his wife, Ellen um McLean, they will all know her too. She's on she, a voice on a game. And uh anyways, I worked with both of them a lot. They're great. And John was my Vandegelder. And boy, he was super to work with. You're dependent on Vandegelder when you're Dolly. You have to have a good Vandegelder. Mm -hmm. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So my next question is is about your book, um, Prudence Pickle Presents: Etiquette for Professional Actors, which is fantastic for the listeners who are listening who haven't read it. It's a must read for young actors and and any actors. Um, but how did that come about? What was your experience writing it? Well, over the years, um, um, things would come up in rehearsals, um, and you discover that um, some um, some actors um, don't don't know the unwritten rules of etiquette, and it can be embarrassing. Um, and I saw one really great actor from a really one of the top programs ask a lighting designer um, if it was going to be that dark, you know, during the, the first tech rehearsal. Oh. <laughs> and you don't, you know, their whole, you know, they don't even have all the lights rigged yet. And mm-hmm. you don't, you don't, you don't criticize another artist. Yeah. Like that. And um, anyways, things like that would would come up, and I thought, well, there really is a need for this. And also, I felt like we were losing all the superstitions, which are fun, mm-hmm. and traditions, and and things like that that are they're fun and they enrich things in it, and they go way back. Things like break a leg and don't whistle backstage, and et cetera. And so I started writing it. And um, I, I, I have a friend who's a great cartoonist and very funny. His name's Thomas Q. Morris, and he did a lot of uh, work out in L.A. in film. And we went to uh, college together at the University of Montana. And he's a brilliant actor in mind. He's just really great. And so I asked him to do the illustrations. And he said, no, you have to do them. And I said, I cannot draw. And he goes, yes, you can. And I said, no, I really can't, Tom. And he goes, I know you can. I've seen your stuff. He goes, it, it's it got to look like fruit. It's, you've got to do them. And so I did one. It was the one for dance class, the tap dancer. Mm-hmm. It, I thought it was so awful. I just put the book on the shelf for like years and didn't touch it. And then I dusted it off and I talked to another cartoonist and he sent me, I mean, he was really good too. And I looked at it and I thought, this is really an excellent sketch. What's wrong with it? You know, what is wrong with it? And I Mm -hmm. thought it's too good. It was too (laughs) like Tom's and, and it also, both of them look like a man drew them. Now Prudence Pickle is an old actress. (laughs) Hello, <laughs> yeah, and it has to look like she drew them. And I'm an older actress. I hate to admit it, but I'm a veteran. And 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 something about my drawings, you know, um, people identify with. And <laughs> they, they think they're funny, and, and I think they're funny, but it's it's definitely not good art. <laughs> but they work for the book, and I I covered. Everything I think, except um, how to treat your costumes and how to behave in a fitting and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard from one of my favorite costumers about that. So, um, <laughs> uh, and I need to add that. And I also wrote one for the audience. And so I, what happened was I, I wrote this book and I had my friend pretend she was Prudence Pickle. And we went to this Actors Expo in Minneapolis and I'm sitting in the audience, and it's mm-hmm. like hearing your parents read your diary. I was squirming, <laughs> and um, and then at the end of the workshop, we did. She did. She read from the book, and um, everybody said, "Well, where can we buy the book?" And um, I looked at at her, and I said, "Wow, well, what do we say?" And she goes, "Tell them you're taking orders." And I went, "Oh, we're taking orders over here." So they all went in their purses and got out their checkbooks and they said, how much? And I went <laughs> over to her, how much? <laughs> so we we had to get a book out because we took all these checks. So we had to print it. It was just pieces of typed paper. And so <laughs> we went to this uh, printing place at a technical college, Dunwoody, and we had a, 
uh, an, an earlier version, and it was small, like Victorian or Edwardian books for ladies. It fit in the palm of your hand and in a little. Oh, room. really? And I and it and uh, they're real sweet and and we had one for the audience too. And we said twenty dollars, and we'll also give you a free audience etiquette because I do have that written. It's not illustrated. Mm published yet and then i i i sent letters to like seattle repertory theater gift shop the guthrie mm -hmm. theater gift shop and chan hassan's kiosk chan hassan dinner theaters and they all said yeah and they started selling them and then i sent one to lynn manuel miranda's bookshop in new york oh wow and they said, well, we are moving to a new building after, you know, 80 years or whatever they were at that mm -hmm. one place. And everything's in storage. But after we get in our new building, contact me again. So I did. And a month goes by and I thought, uh, I, I need to do a follow-up call. They're going to reject it. And so I, 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 um, I didn't call. I kept putting it off and putting it off. And then, Nate, I get a phone call. And this man goes, and I hadn't done any phone calls. I just sent the letter a long time ago. And this this voice goes, yes, um, can I speak with Peggy O'Connell? <laughs> I thought it was one of my actor friends from New York joking around. And I went, <laughs> hey, yes, you can speak with Peggy O'Connell. And, and he goes, Peggy this is Marcus Colloran from Lynn Manuel Miranda's bookshop in New York. And we absolutely love your book. We thought it was charming and we'd like to sell it. How much would you want for it? And I went, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so they've had four, four or, or loads of books. I've sent them four boxes of books so far. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and Marcus Colloran is, has been really nice and, He's a great guy. And I, I finally, after um, a few orders, told him, I said, I'm sorry, I was I was imitating your accent. I said, I thought you were my friend Mark Zimmerman or Steve Berger in New York. <laughs> and, oh, that's all right. And, and <laughs> he's, been, he's been a great friend to me. Um, and so it took off. And and actually, a lot of older actors have liked it, not just for their classes, but there are things in here like etiquette for when you do a cabaret act that I learned mm -hmm. from Stiller's friends and how you're supposed to introduce famous people when they're in the audience at your act. There's a specific way you go about it. You talk to them and et cetera. And things um, dancing teachers taught at, told me and all these rules that, People my age didn't even know them all. And, and the traditions, you know, and I talked to Stephanie Zimbalist about the movie etiquette and some that I had learned on my own. Mm -hmm. And um, and just a lot of it is school of hard knocks. And and it has it had a veracity of its own. And I'm just I just wanted to get it finished. And I self published. This wasn't done by a publisher. I self published. Oh really? Yes. And I made back the money I invested right away. I mean, it's a miracle. It really is, but it's really good information. I mean, it, well, it, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it, it, it definitely is. It, it, um, I certainly learned a lot from, from reading your book and. Oh, good. And I, I know that, uh, to your point earlier that, that a lot of that stuff isn't taught anymore, you know, like whistling backstage and stuff. Uh, my theater teacher in high school this year, uh, Miss Byroad, um, does talk about the whistling and, and gets, uh, she? yes. Yeah. That was, uh, one of the, one of the first things that she said about superstitions in, uh, in class was don't whistle in my theater. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. Cause it used to, before they had headsets, it, it was, it would single the flyman to pull a drop in and those roll drops had pipes on them and you'd get mm -hmm. clocked and, and the, and the superstition sucked, but it's on Amazon. Anyone can get it on Amazon etiquette for professional actors, uh, by Prudence Pickle as told to Peggy O'Connell. <laughs> I've done interviews as Prudence 
and we really? I do workshops as well. Yes, oh yes, have to have the wig and costume on though. <laughs> and I I went to a thespian convention and did workshops as Prudence. That was fun. Um, but that yeah, fun. It, I so appreciate that you you got a lot out of it, uh, Nate, because it it really I I'm just thrilled with it, and it means a lot to me when a young actor reads it and and learn something they didn't know before it sounds like you have a great teacher yes i do yeah <laughs> um so uh i do think talking about your book is a uh, is a nice segue into this next part and i uh if you don't mind i would like to play a little bit of a a game with you based on a question that one of our listeners sent in okay um so I was browsing through the questions that were sent in for this episode, and one of them was, what is the most unprofessional thing that you've seen someone do on a set? And I On a movie sorta, set? Or on a theater or movie set. And, okay. and I thought it would be fun if, uh, if I could turn it into a little bit of a, a rapid fire game, and so I've been sort of brainstorming ideas for this for the past couple of days. But... Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rapid fire you situations within a theater setting. And all you have to do is answer with something that you shouldn't do in that situation. Okay. So, so like if I were to say read throughs, you could respond with changing your voice every line or something like that. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Good. So <laughs> without further ado, here's a game that I'm going to call non-examples. Oh my gosh. Okay. So... The first topic is auditions. Okay. Uh, let's see. Auditions. Don't be late. And um, don't break other people's concentration when you're in the waiting room. And, oh, there's a million there. Don't snap <laughs> your fingers at the piano player. Uh, uh, and uh, don't shake hands unless they offer. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Second, during a rehearsal. During the rehearsal, don't leave your belongings out in the aisles um, or not or on the floor anywhere. You should have them in a seat or back in the dressing room because the director is constantly moving around checking sight lines. And um, in technical rehearsals, you should never be the poor person who calls for line because by that time it is <laughs> late in the game and there's nothing more horrendous than someone going, ah, line. <laughs> <laughs> during tech week and no <laughs> third is backstage backstage um uh, uh what you don't want to do is be noisy and what you don't want to do is distract people when they're on stage and um let's see um backstage oh when you go behind a, a roll drop or a scrim you don't want to run because it mm. makes it move Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fourth is at an after party. After party. You know, I don't go to a lot of parties, but um, there are some you're obligated to go to where board members are and mm -hmm. uh, uh, supporters. Um, well, let's see. Uh, well, um I guess you wouldn't want to drink too much in, in the case of your young people that doesn't apply. Um, you want to, uh, after party, this isn't a good one for me. I'm not really a party goer. Um, usually there's a matinee after opening night and I, I mm -hmm. just go and leave because you've got to get your rest after rehearsing yeah. and rehearsing and being there for those late tech hours. So I would say, you know, keep the drinking to a minimum and um, uh, uh, don't be trying to get a job, mm. you know, okay. just be social. Um, that That's a turnoff, especially for people who aren't in the business who are there with their spouse. They don't want to talk shop, They, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's like a teacher seeing their students after class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, kind of. <laughs> so about that arithmetic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, next up is while receiving director's notes. 
Okay. Um, don't argue. You just take that note, have a and 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 don't show up without a big pencil and a notebook, even <laughs> if you don't need to write them down, because that makes a director very happy and confident that he'll never have to give you the same note twice. But if you need to discuss it with him, if you're having a problem getting to a certain place on time, or if it's a certain thing that um, um, impedes you from doing what he wants, don't talk to him during the note session about it. Mm -hmm. if you can. But take the note, definitely. Uh, and then finally is on opening night. Opening night. Um, get there early. People always have presents and flowers, and it's real distracting, and it takes up a lot of time and space in the dressing room. And you need to get there early and um, and say break a leg and, instead of good luck, because some people are very, very superstitious. Um, and be of good cheer. Support everybody. I guess I didn't do the don't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be late. <laughs> no, you you did a very good job. Thank you for playing along. <laughs> it's a hard game, especially <laughs> about the parties. <laughs> um, all right, and so uh, I just have a few questions um, from some other listeners um, that were sent in. Uh, and uh, first off is actually from uh, one of my good friends, um, who really enjoys uh, Minnesota. So oh. Okay. Um, but uh, his name is Evan, and he asked, what do you think your connection is like between fellow cast members during a production? Professional, friendly, and kind. And, and oh, flexible. Flexible and open to suggestion. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, want, you don't want to be a naysayer. Um, you don't want to say... No, oh, I don't. I no, that won't work. If another actor wants to work on something with you, you know, before rehearsal or out on a break, um, you know, be agreeable to it. You know, let let that person do their process. You know, they they'll probably come up with a great idea you're going to want to do with them. And um, just don't um, don't be a naysayer and be friendly and professional and positive. Um. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that um, sometimes, uh, you know, young actors will will try and give each other feedback. And, and this applies to me, too. It, sometimes they're not as receptive to that feedback as they probably should be. Well, um, well there's, there's a professional rule. You don't give another actor a note. Like, you don't say, um, you, you don't use the word should. I would never come up to you. Nate and say, Nate, you know, you should take a pause before you say this word. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to do that. Um, and you don't. But if another actor says, say, let's work out our entry, say, um, let's work out our, 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 um, our, our entrance. They may, let's say they enter together and mm -hmm. or that someone has an idea about how to do it. Like I'll look back at you and you go like, you know, you raise your hands like, I don't know, something they want to work out with you yeah. that is telling you how to do your show um, so that you, you'll, you're you workable. But mm -hmm. um, but you never, you never give another actor a note. That's a huge no-no. You will learn that in school. That's not a rule of etiquette. That's a rule of professionalism. And only the director and the stage manager and the conductor, musical director, Mm, they mm -hmm. can notes, no other actor. And um, if you're having a problem with another actor, um, then you go to the stage manager. You don't you don't address it yourself. That's the professional way to do it because it's such a it's a personal kind of job. Mm -hmm. it's fun. And when people are creating and and looking at at being in front of an audience, they're they're very vulnerable and to be a good actor, you have to be vulnerable. So you have to be careful about that. And I think that's a really good uh, behavior for professionals, a, a good professional behavior, rather. Um, yeah, uh, like John Plumpus was saying um, in in episode one, uh, uh, you know, he talked about 
um, that sort of vulnerability on stage. But he also talked about you have to sort of develop and I, these, these were his words and uh, comfortability with being uncomfortable. Yeah, that's John's so smart um, about acting. I love working with him. Um, he, when I worked with him in um, Utah, we would go over our scenes a million times together. And, and he was, we always wanted to do that on our own. We never mm -hmm. gave each other notes. But yeah, um, you have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. That's a very complex thing to talk about. Um, you know, your instrument is you and every, your body and every experience you've ever had in your life that you draw from that's personal mm -hmm. and to get to that and and put it out there is is can be uncomfortable i mean not everything is happy happy musical comedy <laughs> <laughs> even musical comedy can be painful. yeah <laughs> um all right next up is from lily and uh they asked how do you suggest doing different accents or modifying your voice in various ways for certain characters well, um, everybody has an optimal pitch range for their singing. And I think um, when you find that uh, in voice lessons or speech lessons, you'll know how high and how low you should go. And, and, and that means when you're projecting. Um, what I do is um, uh, I, I always had, they were cassette tapes and little books then. And I'm sure they probably have them on MP3s now but you would have one for a German accent, one for a British, one for mm -hmm. all the different um, English and Irish and, and Scottish and and you and Southern, and you'd listen to these tapes and look at that in the book. And that's how you did it. Vocal things, character voices, you, um, you have to be able to do them with, um, with the correct way supporting with your diaphragm and keeping your throat open like you're going to yawn and i thought barbara streisand was a, she's a genius at this whenever she's doing a character voice it's always with an open throat yet it's a great character voice huh. and if you study all of her roles and all of her recordings she does some character work but it's so well produced and um, that's my advice is, oh, um, there's also a reference book. It's downstairs, so I'll have to email you the name of it. And it'll tell you what movies to watch to get certain dialects. Huh. And when you listen to it, um, you know, a lot of people learn by ear. I know I do. And other people um, um, uh, do it in the written way. But I, mm -hmm. I kind of do both. And um, I will accent a, a syllable, or you know, change it to what they what the accent changes it to in pencil. But I really get it through listening. It's like music, but you always, you, whenever you do a character voice, you have to make sure you're doing it the same way you you um, you um, support your voice for speaking on stage or singing. You cannot mm -hmm. put tension and stress on it, and you don't want to be out of your range and find the movies that you can listen to um, documentaries because they aren't actors. Yeah, uh, over the summer, I played a role uh, actually in a show that I wrote um, oh. for, uh, for a young playwriting competition, but the, the character was uh, Cockney British. And so I listened to uh, Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins just like on oh. a loop for a while. <laughs> Uh-huh. That's good. Excellent. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Get it yeah, in your ear. And I, I'm sure I looked really, really weird, you know, sit, uh, sitting there after rehearsal with my phone up to my ear listening to Dick Van Dyke, but... <laughs> he was, he's a great actor. Oh my gosh, he could do anything. Yeah, he's hilarious. He is great. Oh, yeah, that's a yeah. You sound like you learn by ear. That's great. Mm -hmm. that, anyway, that's my advice. You know, um, don't strain it. Do not strain your voice. It's got to last you a long time. 
Um, all right, and then uh, I'm going to move into the last segment of the episode, which I like to call the Theater Threes, and you might recognize it from the episode, the last two episodes, where I'm going to ask you three questions that I ask to everybody that I have on the podcast, uh, just sort of so the listeners can, can get to know them and, and a little bit more about, you know, some of the the more, like, trivial things about uh, their theater careers and things like that. Okay. So, and you can answer long, short, elaborate however you feel like. Okay. So the first question is, what is your favorite musical? My favorite musical is, um, it's a toss up between two. Can I say? Sure. Um, it, yeah. It's a toss up between Fiddler on the Roof and the Music Man. Um, and <laughs> boy, guys and dolls too, but they're perfect pieces mm-hmm. and they're what what um we what some people call active proof because they're so well written as long as you don't mug and overdo it yeah uh, and music man is absolutely brilliant and and so is fiddler on the roof they're, they just rip your heart out and make you laugh so hard they're clever they're believable characters and they they come from the heart so I, I those two are my top. It's hard and, to think. And the uh, Fiddler and Music Man, I mean, they're even still today, like since they were created, I mean, they've also sort of stood the test of time. Like they're just, they're they're timeless. Yes. And they finally did a, a, a complete Yiddish version of Fiddler in New York. And I was, oh, I was, they did? Yes. I wish I could have seen it. Oh, I mean... I mean, it's it sounds Yiddish, the rhythms and mm-hmm. everything. Yeah, yeah, it's a brilliant piece. I, I love it. Uh, the second question of the theater threes is: What actor did you look to look up to as a young person, and why? Hmm. Well, I looked up to Barbara Streisand. And um, Dorothy Provine, she was a performer slash singer. And, um, and well, oh, I know, <laughs> I know. It was a uh, uh, Jackie Gleason and Frank Frank Fontaine, who was on the Jackie Gleason show. Ha, oh, boy, he could sing, and he was hilarious. And that was my first imitation as a child. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have to say Frank Fontaine. Uh, and then finally, uh, what advice do you have for theater kids or anyone wanting to get into theater? Um, I would say do it if, if you, if you love it, love it. You have to really, really love it because because it can be very tough, especially for women. And, um, and you have to be able to um, take it on the chin sometimes, you know, and, and keep a stiff upper lip because it can be brutal. Um, and, you know, you can be out of work and, and lose your confidence. Maybe you'll work with someone who shreds your confidence um, and you've got to get back on the horse. And I mean, that could happen in any business, I imagine. But it's a demanding business. And if you think you can stay um, stay the course and keep your instrument in good shape and keep working at it and um, play the long game, you have to, if you think you can do that and you love it, you have to love it. Um, because if you just kind of do it for the glory of it, um, it won't be satisfying. You have to love the art form. That's my best advice. Um, uh, and yeah, that's that's my best advice. You have to really, really love it to do it. And, and it's a wonderful job. I love my job. I've been very, very, very lucky. Very lucky. And, um, and I work hard. And I love my work. And I love watching young talent and working with young talent 
and I especially loved working with you. And I'm not just saying that because this is a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for, for being here. It was lovely, lovely to talk to you again. It's It's been a while and uh, let's do it again soon. Okay, come visit me in, in Minnesota. I have a guest bedroom. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Best of luck to you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Peggy. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. You were such an amazing interview, and I hope I can work with you again soon. To all of you out there who want to read Peggy's book, a link to it is available in the description, and so is the link to her latest movie, Merry Kiss Cam, which is now streaming on Hulu and is the perfect way to kick off the holiday season. If you know someone who'd enjoy this podcast, please share it with them so that they can learn from experts from around the theater industry like Peggy. If you are a theater kid or a theater kid at heart, and you're interested in submitting a question for our next episode, you can shoot us an email with your question to theatercues at natewileyproductions.com. Thank you all so much for listening today. Theater Cues is produced by Nate Wiley Productions and me, Nathaniel Wiley, featuring music by Joyheads. Joyheads is a Pasadena-based music group composed of Juan Gomez, Daniel Johnson, and Jeremy King. The song that you heard in this episode is A Real Good Time. If you like what you hear on this podcast, follow the podcast and check out our website, natewileyproductions.com, for a wide variety of content, from historical series to photo galleries and much, much more. Thank you for listening, and have a happy Thanksgiving.